Welcome back to the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. It's Resident Evil Caliban Cove by S.D. Perry. My name is Harry. You can follow the channel on Twitter at Fulcrum underscore ENT. And if you're looking for any other audiobooks that we've done here on the channel or trying to find another part of this audiobook, go into the description below for links to all our playlists. I don't forget my friends in the comments, so let's welcome a new one, Ultraviolet Gum, who says you have a good reading voice. Thanks very much for commenting, Ultraviolet Gum. I really hope you continue to enjoy the book. And let's say hello to a regular, Samuel Cuthbert, who on the last video said, Sweet choice, man. I don't know much about Resident Evil, but I do remember the last Resident Evil audiobook you did, and I loved it. So I know this one will be just as good, if not better. Thanks so much for your, uh, your confidence and your trust, Samuel. I really appreciate it. And yes, this will be a good book, not necessarily because of me, but certainly because the author, S.D. Perry, is fantastic, and I always love what she writes. I will come back to comments again in between the chapters, but for now, I want to get reading, so let's jump in to chapter three. Jill felt her heart quicken at Rebecca's words, a feeling that things were happening too fast and that they weren't prepared. Her decision seemed sudden. Even though Jill really hadn't doubted that she'd volunteer, Rebecca was a lot stronger than she'd looked. She glanced around Barry's wide, open living room, discreetly noting the reactions of her teammates. Chris's face was strained, his mouth drawn as he stared absently at the map of Caliban Cove, while Barry walked across to one of the living room windows, staring out past the curtain and scowling at nothing in particular. They're worried about her. Maybe they should be. Griffith sounds like a serious psycho. But would any of us have hesitated if we'd been asked to go? It just proved that Rebecca was as committed as they were. Also, no great surprise. Getting to know the young Bravo had been one of the only bright spots in the frustrating days since the mansion had burned. The girl had been unfailingly optimistic about their chances against Umbrella, even after their suspension, and had worked tirelessly to keep all of their spirits up. She was brilliant, too, and yet she never flaunted it, or came across as condescending when she was attempting to discuss aspects of the T-virus with them. Rebecca looked a bit distraught herself, glancing around at the three men in the room. Even David Trapp seemed vaguely uncomfortable with her decision probably because of Rebecca's youth. Men. She's young, she's cute, and she's undoubtedly smarter than all of us put together. But the young and cute part tends to make them overlook the rest. Jill caught her eye and smiled encouragingly. At Rebecca's age, Jill had been a professional thief, and a good one. She was worried about Rebecca too, but only because she'd grown to care about her. The fact that she was a young woman wasn't a reason to underestimate her talents. Rebecca smiled back and walked over to sit by her as David nodded hesitantly at his newest teammate. All right then, good. There's a plane leaving for Bangor at 2300 hours, with a connecting flight to a field just outside of Exeter. I thought we could all go over a bit of strategy here and then drop by your place on the way to the airfield so you can pack a few things. Rebecca nodded and after cracking a window open, Barry moved back to join them, leaning against one arm of the couch. He folded his arms across his massive chest and jerked his chin toward David. You're the strategist, he said, not unkindly. Why don't you start us off? The respect between the two men was obvious, making Jill like David all the more. In spite of Barry's screw-ups in the Spencer fiasco, Jill had grown to trust him, something she didn't do easily, and he seemed confident in David Trapp's skills. I don't mean to take over, David said, but I have a few thoughts on how we might approach this situation. I've known about the star's betrayal for several days now. Though I thought we all might spend a few moments considering our course of action, I realize that this must come as quite a shock. Jill picked up on the same thread of bitterness she'd noticed earlier, on the word betrayal, the fact that the stars were in bed with Umbrella obviously wasn't sitting too well with Mr. Trapp. Probably not with Chris or Barry either. Both of them have more time invested with the stars than me or Becca. Jill was disappointed and angry that the stars had sold out, 
but it wasn't going to be a factor in her decision to work at bringing Umbrella down. Her path had been determined on the day that the McGee sisters had been brutally murdered. The two little girls were the first innocent victims of the T-virus spill at the Spencer estate, and they had been her friends. She pushed the thoughts away, focusing on the matter at hand. Without the stars, their job was going to be a lot tougher. Not impossible, but she had to admit to herself that their chance of success had just dropped to somewhere near zero. It was a good thing she didn't mind being the underdog. It doesn't matter anyway. Umbrella's going to pay for what they've done, one way or another. Barry's gruff voice broke the quiet in the room, his gaze thoughtful. Maybe we should go to the press. Not local. Something big. National. David sighed, shaking his head. I thought of that. It's a good idea, but right now we don't have the proof to make anything stick. Yeah, but at least Umbrella wouldn't move on us with everyone watching. We couldn't count on that, Jill said. If they got to the stars, they could get to anyone. And without evidence? Well, you gotta admit, the story's the kind of thing even the tabloids wouldn't buy. There was a moment of sullen silence, as if her words reminded them all of how insane it sounded. How insane it would sound to anyone who hadn't experienced what they'd been through. A virus that accidentally turns people into zombies, being used to create unspeakable monsters as living weapons. Invented and then covered up by a major corporation that hires mad scientists to experiment on human beings. All it needs is a Nazi war criminal with an atomic weapon. We'd have a bestseller on our hands. Well, what were we talking about before? Uh, Organizing some of the other stars, Chris said. I've got a few people in mind. Some of the guys I trained with, and I know Barry's got a lot of contacts. David nodded agreement. Yes, I think that should be a priority. My concern is how to get in touch with them. The branch offices may already be tapped, and we want to keep Umbrella from learning about our plans for as long as possible. Unfortunately, we won't have use of the star's resources for much longer. Maybe we should look for a go-between, Jill said slowly. Someone who doesn't have ties to the stars. Chris grinned suddenly. I know a guy from back in the Air Force who works for Jack Hamilton now, uh, one of the section heads for the FBI. I don't know much about Hamilton, but Pete's about as honest as they come, and he owes me a favor. Brilliant, David said. Perhaps you could ask him to help you look into the local police as well. Once we have solid evidence from the main facility, we can go to your friend, instigate a federal investigation. It sounded good, But Jill found herself feeling frustrated by the talk. She wanted to act. Waiting for the stars to contact them had been bad enough. Knowing that Rebecca was going to be risking her life while they waited idly by would be excruciating. You said you had some thoughts about what else we could do, she said. David nodded. Yes, though once we involve the government, it may not come to anything quite so daring. I had been formulating a plan to infiltrate Umbrella Headquarters, a risky operation at best. It seems wisest to work on a smaller scale for now, but I do believe the three of you should drop out of sight as soon as possible. I also think it would be prudent for you to see what you can uncover on Mr. Trent, though I have the distinct feeling that you won't come up with much, if anything. He smiled a little, and having met Trent, Jill understood his doubts perfectly. Their strange benefactor had struck her as a very careful man. I get the impression that we'll only find what he wants us to find, David continued, but it is worth a look, and we'll need to arrange for a rendezvous site after we've... His soft, musical voice broke off suddenly as he tilted his head to one side, listening intently. Jill heard it in the same instant and felt her heart freeze in her chest. A rustling in the bushes outside the window that Barry had opened. Umbrella! Get down! Jill shouted and rolled off the couch, pulling Rebecca with her as the window shattered, the curtains blown aside in an explosive burst from an automatic rifle. David dove for the floor as bullets riddled the chair he'd been in, already grabbing for his weapon. 
Tufts of padding floated past his eyes as a smoking trail of holes tore across the wall, plaster and wood flying. Bloody hell! There was a split-second break in the onslaught, just long enough for them to hear the crash of glass breaking from the back of the house. Barry, lights! he shouted, but Barry was way ahead of him, the thunder of his Colt revolver drowning out the intermittent spray of the machine gun. Boom! Boom! The room went dark as Barry's rounds found their mark, glass raining down from above. Light still streamed into the darkness from the hall, and there was another hail of bullets from outside. Chris scrabbled on elbows and knees for the hallway, and in one smooth movement rolled onto his side and took out the additional lights. The living room was now completely black, and the burst of automatic fire stopped. With the ringing in his ears, David heard boots crunching on the glass from the back of the kitchen. The heavy steps paused the intruder probably waiting for the window shooter to catch up. And there will be more than two, covering the exits, kitchen door, front porch, someone watching the windows. Another set of steps entered the kitchen. These hurried and shuffling, but they also stopped. The pair was waiting, either for more of their team or for the assembled stars to make a move. David's thoughts raced independently of him, reflexively considering and rejecting theories and options at lightning speed. We get upstairs, pick them off one at a time, unless they mean to torch the house. So we ran straight through them, at the back. Except they've got the firepower advantage. Maybe spook eyes and we're moving targets. No contest. All he knew for certain was that they couldn't stay where they were. There was no cover for when the thugs got tired of waiting. There was a shuffling movement from the right as Barry's hulking shadow crouched toward him. David's eyes had adjusted enough to see Jill and Rebecca on the other side of the coffee table, both of them crouched and holding handguns. He couldn't make Chris out, but he was probably still by the hall. Barry's house was the last on the block, a wooded park just past. If they could slip out, get into the trees. The thought stuck. Even a bad plan was better than none at all, and they didn't have time to work out alternatives. Basement door, David whispered. Barry's gruff voice was soft and strained. Yeah. No good. It would be posted. They'd have to get out through the second floor. We go through the park, he whispered quickly. Jill, get to Chris and prepare to lay cover on my signal. Barry, Rebecca, as soon as we start, hit the stairs fast to an east window. Softest jump. We'll follow. Ready? Go! Jill was already moving around the couch, disappearing silently into the thick shadows. Barry and Rebecca right behind. David paused just long enough to scoop up the papers that Trent had given him. He stuffed them inside his shirt, the crinkling pages cool against his sweaty skin. Nothing else in his briefcase would be damaging. He crept toward the yawning blackness of the opening to the hall, edging to where Jill and Chris were crouched. The entry faced the side of the stairs. To the left was the front door and the foot of the steps. To the right, the quiet kitchen at the end of the long hall where the two umbrella operatives waited. They go right, I'll take left. When the shooting begins, the rest of the strike force should rush the front door. David hoped. If the timing wasn't perfect, they were dead. Away from the faint light from the windows, it was too dark for hand signals. He leaned close between Jill and Chris, pitching his voice as low as possible. Both right, Jill low and outside, he whispered. They wouldn't be aiming for the door, and Chris could use the wall of the entry as a shield. I've got the front door. Keep it up for six seconds exactly, no more. On zero, you need to be on the stairs, out of the corridor. On my mark. Now! The three of them sprang into position. Chris and Jill firing toward the kitchen, David whirling to the left. He ran for the front door in a low crouch, the count ticking. Five. Four. Behind him, Barry and Rebecca lunged for the stairs, through the crash of bullets. David trained the Beretta on the darkness in front of him, and was only a foot away from the door when someone kicked it open. Bam! His shoulder connected with the heavy wood, and he threw himself into it, slamming it closed. He dropped to the floor and jammed his heel against the base. Two! 
He fired into the door at an upward angle, five shots as fast as he could pull the trigger. There was a strangled scream, the sound of something heavy hitting the porch, and he fired three more before rolling onto his feet, into the alcove at the foot of the stairs, and out of the line of fire. Their time was up. David spun and saw Jill and Chris already on their way, up, and, as his feet hit the first riser, there was a sound like an explosion behind him. The front door was suddenly a mass of flying splinters, heavy rounds tearing through the wood as the Umbrella team sought to end the battle. If the two Alphas hadn't killed the men in the kitchen, they were surely dead by now. Halfway up the stairs, David turned and fired twice more through the rapidly disintegrating door, hoping he'd bought the stars enough time to escape. Ten, maybe twenty seconds before they realise we're gone. It was going to be close. Rebecca stood on the dark landing, her heart pounding almost as loudly as the booming shots that chased Jill and Chris up the stairs. Come on! Come on! Barry was to her right at the end of the landing's hall, barely visible by the moonlight that streamed through the open window. Jill was the first to reach the top. Rebecca steered her toward Barry with a touch, Chris following close behind. Bam! Bam! The muzzle on David's 9mm flashed brightly in the darkness on the stairs, and then he was in front of her, materialising out of the gloom like a sweaty ghost. This way! Rebecca turned and ran for the window, David at her side. Jill had already gone and Chris was halfway out, Barry gripping one of his hands as he struggled to balance himself. Please, God, let there be a mattress, a, a pile of leaves! Boom! The crash of the front door flying open was followed by heavy footsteps and muffled male voices, angry and commanding. Chris disappeared through the window and then Barry was reaching for her, his mouth a grim line. She jammed her pistol back in its holster and stepped to the window. Barry's warm hand on her back, Rebecca crawled onto the sill and looked down. There were hedges against the side of the house, lush and thick and impossibly far below. She caught a glimpse of Jill standing on the lawn, aiming her weapon toward the front of the house, and Chris looking up at them, his face tight with strain. Don't think, just do it! Rebecca slid out of the window, Barry's strong fingers finding her hand. Her shoulder groaned as gravity did its work, Barry leaning out to give her less of a drop, her body suspended in midair. He let go, and before she could feel the terror, she hit the bushes. There was a small pain, twigs and branches scratching in her bare legs, and then Chris was pulling her out, lifting her easily from the twining hedges. Take the back, he breathed, his attention already fixed back on the window. Rebecca snatched the revolver out as she stepped onto the lawn, turning to face the shadows that made up the backyard. To her left, a dark stand of trees stood maybe twenty metres away, silent and still. Hurry! Hurry! There was a thundering rattle of bullets inside the house and a thrashing thump in the bushes to her right, but she didn't turn, intent on her assigned task. A movement by the corner of the house. Rebecca didn't hesitate, sending two shots into the thickening shadow. Barry's thirty-eight jerking in her hands. The figure crumpled, falling forward just enough for her to see that she'd hit a man clutching a rifle and that he wasn't going to get up again. Never shot anybody before. Move! Chris shouted, and Rebecca jerked her head around, saw Barry climb out of the bushes and stumble toward them. There was a shout from the window, followed by a burst from an automatic rifle. Rebecca actually felt the bullets hit the ground near her feet, tearing up chunks of overgrown lawn. Dirt pelted her legs. Shit! David and Jill fired back as they ran for the trees, Chris leading the way. The shooter either ducked or was shot. The dull clatter of the rifle fell silent. As they reached the first of the wooded shadows, Rebecca heard the wail of approaching sirens, followed closely by shouts and running steps across Barry's front porch. Seconds later, there was a squeal of tyres. Rebecca stumbled through the brushy copse, dodging between narrow, gnarled trunks, trying to keep the others in sight. The revolver felt too heavy in her slick grasp, and her entire body seemed to be pounding, her legs shaking, 
her breathing sharp and shallow. Everything had happened so fast. She'd known they were in danger, that Umbrella wanted them out of the way, but knowing something wasn't the same as really believing it, as believing that violent strangers would break into Barry's home and try to take their lives. And I may have taken one of theirs instead. The thought that she might have killed someone. She forced it away before it could take hold, concentrating on the pale shape of Chris's T-shirt ahead. Her conscience would have to wait until she had time to think it through. Ahead of them, the thick woods opened into a clearing, playground equipment gleaming dully in the pallid light. Chris slowed to a jog, and then stopped where the line of trees ended, turning back to search the shadows for the rest of them. Rebecca caught up to him, Barry and Jill just behind her, all of them breathing heavily and looking as stunned and sober as Rebecca felt. David! Where's David? Chris gasped, and as they all turned, straining to see past the dark, reaching branches, Rebecca saw one of the shadows to their left move, a stealthy, sliding movement. Look out! She dropped to the ground even as she yelled, fresh terror surging through her system. And the shadow fired at them, twice. The shots muted compared to the explosive thunder of the house. There was a third shot, closer, louder, and the shadow stumbled and fell, crashing against a tree before collapsing silently to the dirt. Except for the rising moan of sirens, the park was again still. Rebecca slowly raised her head, craning to look over her shoulder, and saw David, standing, still pointing his beretta at the fallen soldier. Jill and Chris were crouched next to her, both of them holding their weapons out, staring around them with wide, searching gazes. And on her other side, Barry was sprawled on the ground, his face pressed to the blanket of dried pine needles and long dead leaves. He wasn't moving. Wow, that was a pretty dramatic chapter. An excellent way, I say, to return to Resident Evil Caliban Cove. This was really good. We often uh, don't see more human-to-human conflict uh, within Resident Evil. It is normally focused on the monsters. But here we get this nice kind of uh, interesting thriller kind of attack almost has a kind of tom clancy vibe to it although i have noticed some people mentioning a few things about the accuracy say of these books when it comes to weaponry and uh, to sort of military terms and use i believe it was our resident virology and immunology student who mentioned uh, the choice to use the term clip instead of magazine, uh, differing from the sort of military standard use. I believe uh, you said that that was the military standard term, magazine. Um, Very interesting. And uh, we also had the debate in Resident Evil City of the Dead uh, about the weaponry and the use of it. For example, you wouldn't be able to fire the Remington shotgun single-handed. And similarly, you might have some difficulty doing that with the Desert Eagle uh, Magnum that Leon was carrying throughout the book. As Ian Matthew Klein said in the comments, Arizona resident here, we're basically the wild west of the US. The Desert Eagle is a Hollywood play. Certainly people own them, but it's not going to be your service weapon for several reasons. So I'd love to know how we felt about the last scene, about the tactical decisions made, about the sort of firepower that was used. Uh, Do you guys think that that was a fun sequence? Do you think it was a bit silly, over the top? Was it not realistic? Let me know. I personally felt it really kicked this book up a notch after it had a bit of a slow start in the last episode of our audiobook. Now I'm going to move on to chapter four. There was darkness for an indeterminate time, silent and complete. And then there were voices drawing him up through the black depths of his limbo, voices that his floating mind couldn't identify at first. From somewhere far away, he heard sirens. He's been hit! Oh my god! See if it's clear! Wait, I I can't find the wound! Help me! Barry! Barry! Can't... Barry, can you hear me? Rebecca. Barry opened his eyes and then closed them immediately, wincing as the throbbing pain wrapped around his skull. 
There was another pain in his left arm, sharp and insistent, but not as complete as the ache in his head. He'd had acquaintance with both kinds of pain before. Got shot, met up with a tree, or some asshole with a baseball bat. He tried opening his eyes again as small hands moved across his chest, lightly searching. It took him a second to focus on the worried faces looming over him. Jill and Chris and a frightened-looking Rebecca, her fingers probing his shirt for the wound. The sirens had fallen mercifully silent, though he could hear the cop cars pulling up his street, their powerfully revving engines echoing through the wooded park. Left bicep, he mumbled and started to sit up. The dark woods wavered unsteadily, and then Rebecca was gently pushing him back down. Don't move, she said firmly. Just lay there a second, okay? Chris, give me your shirt. But, umbrella, Barry started. It's clear, David said, kneeling next to the others. Be still. Rebecca lifted his arm carefully, looking at both sides. Barry flexed his arm slightly and scowled at the burst of pain, but could tell it wasn't bad. The bone was still intact. Right out the deltoid, Rebecca said. Looks like you're going to have to lay off the weights for a while. Her tone was light, but he could see the concern in her gaze as she studied his face. She started wrapping Chris's t-shirt tightly around his arm, watching him intently. You've got a nasty bump on your temple, she said. How do you feel? Though his head was still pounding, the pain had subsided to ache status. He felt light-headed and a little nauseous, but he still knew his own name and what day of the week it was. If it was a concussion, he wasn't impressed. I've had worse hangovers. Pretty much like shit, he said. But I'm okay. I must have hit a tree on the way down. As she finished the makeshift bandage, he sat up again, this time with better results. They had to get moving before the cops decided to search the woods. But where could they go? It seemed unlikely that Umbrella would attack twice in one night, but it wasn't a theory worth testing. None of their homes would be safe. At least his family was out of harm's way visiting Kathy's parents in Florida. The thought that they could have just as easily been at home, his girls playing in their rooms, when the shooting had started, he staggered unsteadily to his feet, finding strength in the rage that he'd lived with since that night at the estate. Wesker had threatened Kathy and the girls to force Barry's cooperation in Umbrella's cover-up, using him to get to the underground laboratories. Barry's guilt had blossomed into fury in the days since an anger that transcended any he'd ever known. Bastards! Barry snarled. Goddamn umbrella bastards! The others stood up with him, Chris's bare chest pale in the faint light, all of them seeming relieved that he wasn't badly hurt, except for David, who looked as unhappy as Barry had ever seen him, his shoulders sagged from some unknown burden and when he spoke, he wouldn't meet Barry's gaze. The man who shot you, David said. He held up a nine millimeter with a suppressor attached. Blood spattered across the barrel. I killed him. I... Barry? It's Jay Shannon. Barry stared at him. He heard the words but was unable to accept them. It wasn't possible. No, you didn't get a good look. It's too dark. David turned and walked through the trees, leading them to the body of the shooter. Barry stumbled after him, his head suddenly aching from more than just smacking it on a tree trunk. It can't be Shannon. There's no way. David's rattled from the attack. That's all. He made a mistake. Except David didn't rattle under fire. He never had and he didn't make mistakes that easily. Barry gritted his teeth against the pain and followed, for once hoping that his friend was wrong. The man had collapsed on his back, or David had rolled him over. Either way, he stared up at them with lifeless eyes, a random pine needle stuck to one of the glazed orbs. 
The semi-jacketed round from David's Beretta had punched a hole directly over his heart. It had been a lucky shot. Looking down at the shooter's ashen face, Barry felt his own heart turn to stone. Jesus, Shannon, why? Why this? Who is he? Jill asked softly. Barry stared down at the dead man, unable to answer. David's reply seemed hollow, toneless. Captain J. Shannon of the Oklahoma City Stars. Barry and I trained with him. Barry found his voice still looking at Jay's still face. I called him last week when I called David. He was worried about us, said he'd keep an eye out for Umbrella. And we shot the shit for another couple of minutes, catching up, telling old stories. I told him I'd send pictures of the kids, and he said that he had to get off the phone, that, that he wanted to talk, but he had to have a meeting. Umbrella must have already got to him and the realization was cold and brutal and suddenly horribly complete. Umbrella may have been behind the attack, but the stars had carried it out. Barry's home had been blown to hell by people they knew, and he'd been shot by a man he thought was a friend. The solemn quiet was broken by the barking of dogs, faint through the shadowy trees. From the number and location, it sounded like the RPD K-9 unit had just reached his house. Barry looked away from the corpse, his thoughts returning to the immediate situation. They had to move. Where can we go? David asked quickly. Is there somewhere Umbrella wouldn't think to look? A cabin, an empty building, some place we can get to on foot? Brad! Chickenheart's lease isn't up for a couple of months, Barry said. His place is empty, and it's less than a mile from here. David nodded briskly. Let's go. Barry turned toward the park's playground, leading the others across the moonlit clearing. There was a small trail that let out two blocks away, hopefully far enough away from the action that the cops wouldn't follow. Barry had walked through the park a million times, his wife at his side, his children dancing at their feet. My home. This is my home, and it won't ever be the same again. As they ran through the warm, peaceful night, Barry felt the hole in his arm start to bleed again. He clapped his right hand over the sticky dressing without slowing, letting the pain fuel his determination as they tore through the scrubby trees and headed for Brad's house. No more. No more of this. My girls aren't going to grow up in a world where this can happen, not if I have any say in it. So much had already happened, and this was only the beginning of their fight. There were still people working with the stars he trusted, that they could count on, and he wasn't going to be caught off guard twice. Next time Umbrella came knocking, maybe they wouldn't have to run, and if Rebecca and David could pull off the main operation, they'd have what they needed to take the company down once and for all. Umbrella had messed with the wrong people. Barry planned on being there when they figured that out. Jill picked the lock expertly, using a bent safety pin and one of Rebecca's earrings to open the door to the small cottage. Rebecca had swept Barry off to the medicine cabinet while Chris went searching for a shirt. David and Jill checked the small house thoroughly. David's satisfaction growing with each passing moment. He couldn't have imagined a better hideout, and it was comforting to know that Barry and the two Alphas would have a safe spot to work from. The two-bedroom home shared a backyard with a security-conscious family. Bright light snapped on when David opened the back door, flooding the small lawn brilliantly. And from the sight of the neighbor's side, they definitely had a rather large dog somewhere on the premises. There were houses close on either side of the rental, and the front window looked out on an open schoolyard just across the street. There would be no cover for an approaching team. The house was furnished simply, if untidily. It was obvious that the occupant had fled in a panic. Personal items and books were strewn randomly across the rooms, as if Vickers had been unable to decide what to take in his hurry to flee Raccoon City. With what happened tonight... I can't say I blame him for running. 
Mr. Vickers had obviously been in the wrong line of work, but that didn't necessarily make him a coward. Risking one's life on a day-to-day -day basis wasn't for everyone. And considering the recent developments, it was wisest for someone like Vickers to remove himself from the situation. They could have used their help, but from what little Barry had told him, the Alpha pilot wasn't someone they wanted to work with. Even if he didn't get himself killed, he lost the trust of his teammates, and nothing could be worse when it came to crisis situations. David sat in the dark, cramped living room on a rather hideous green couch, collecting his exhausted thoughts as Jill dug through the kitchen. He'd found a blank pad of paper and a pen, and had already scribbled down the names and home numbers of his team and various contacts, as well as Brad's phone number to take with him. He gazed blankly around the shadowed room, fighting off the adrenaline slump that so often followed battle. He didn't want to forget anything important any detail that needed to be discussed before he and Rebecca left. If they wanted to make their plane, Barry, Jill and Chris would have to deal with the aftermath of the attack on their own. The stars. Trent's poem, objectives and contacts. It was hard to focus after such a draining experience, and it didn't help matters that he'd been tired to begin with. He hadn't slept well in days, and thinking of all that lay ahead of them only made concentration harder. Rebecca's information about Dr. Griffith was disconcerting to say the least, and though he was no less determined to carry out the Caliban Cove operation, it was just one more concern to add to a seemingly endless list. Chris walked into the room, wearing a faded blue sweatshirt with the sleeves cut off and fell into a chair across from David, his face hidden in shadow. After a moment, he leaned forward, enough light filtering through the closed blinds so that David could see his expression. The younger man's gaze was tired, thoughtful and apologetic. Look, David, the last couple of weeks have been rough on all of us, you know? Waiting to see what Umbrella was going to do, the suspension, feeling like our friends died for nothing. Chris stopped himself, then started again. I just wanted to say... I'm sorry if we got off on the wrong foot earlier, and I'm glad you're on our side. I shouldn't have been such an asshole about it. David was surprised and impressed by the sincerity behind the words. When he was in his twenties, he would have rather had his fingernails pulled out than display any emotion. Except anger, of course. He'd had no trouble in expressing anger. Yet another legacy from dear old dad... I don't think you have anything to be sorry for, David said softly. Your concerns are more than justified. I, I've been under a bit of strain myself, and I didn't mean to come across as domineering. The stars are, that is, they mean a lot to me. And I want us, I want for them to be whole again. Jill walked in from the kitchen, saving David from continuing with his fumbling speech. Much to his relief, Chris seemed to understand. He met David's gaze evenly, nodding, as if to say that the air had been cleared between them. David sighed inwardly, wondering if he'd ever be able to overcome his awkwardness with expressing emotions. He'd done a lot of thinking since Barry had first called, about himself and his almost obsessive anger over the star's betrayal, and had to come to the unsettling realisation that he wasn't happy with the way his life was turning out. He'd thrown himself into his career in an effort to avoid dealing with a dysfunctional childhood, something he'd always known. But now, facing Umbrella and the treachery of an organisation that he considered his family, he'd been forced to really think about the implications of his choice. It had made him an excellent soldier, but he didn't have any close friends or attachments and having his family taken away had come as a cruel wake-up to the fact that he had based his life on running from human contact. Brilliant for me to have figured it out this late in the game. I suppose I should thank Umbrella for that much. If they don't kill me, they'll at least have managed to send me into therapy. Jill had brought out a pitcher of water and several mismatched glasses, which she placed around as Barry and Rebecca joined them. Barry wore a clean bandage on his arm and seemed pale in the dim light, 
certainly shaken by their discovery of Captain Shannon. David felt bad about killing Shannon, though he reconciled himself long ago to the realities of combat. In a war, people died. The captain had made his choice, and it had been the wrong one. They drank in silence. The four raccoon stars, ex-stars, he reminded himself, pensive and somber, perhaps aware of the ticking clock. He and Rebecca would have to leave in a few moments. There was a convenience store a block away where they could telephone for a cab. David wished he could think of something encouraging to say, but the truth was the truth. They were going on a dangerous mission and there were no guarantees that any of them would survive to meet again. Have you thought about what you'll tell the local police? David asked finally. Barry shrugged. We won't have to lie much, anyway. The three of us were in my place. A bunch of guys broke in and tried to shoot us. We ran. Irons will probably try to play it off as a botched burglary, Chris sneered. If he's in this as deep as I think he is, he won't want to call attention to anything Umbrella's doing. Just be careful not to mention actually seeing any bodies, David said. They may have had time to clean up, and you should say that you were chased into the park. It would explain your leaving the scene, as well as Captain Shannon's body. Barry smiled tiredly. We'll handle it. I'm going to make some calls first thing tomorrow, get us some backup. You just worry about your end, okay? David nodded and stood up, as did Chris. David shook hands all around and then turned to Rebecca, uncomfortably aware that he was taking her off from her teammates and trusted friends. The girl looked at the others in turn with a thoughtful expression and then grinned suddenly, an unaffected and purely wicked smile. Sure you guys can hold down the fort for a couple of days? I hate to think of you flailing around all directionless while me and David go clean up this umbrella thing. We'll try to limp along without you. Chris shot back, smiling. Won't be easy, what with you having the brain and all. Rebecca punched him lightly on the shoulder. I'll send you a postcard with instructions. She nodded at Barry. Take care of your arm. Keep it clean and dry. And if you spike a fever or get dizzy, get to a doctor. ASAP. Barry smiled. Yes, ma'am. Jill embraced her lightly. Give him hell, Becca. Rebecca nodded. You too. Good luck with irons. She turned to David, still smiling. Shall we? They walked to the front door together, David wondering at the girl's easy demeanor. They just barely survived a serious attack, carried out by people who'd probably trained her and she was leaving with a man she hardly knew to embark on a life-threatening mission. She was either putting on an act or was amazingly optimistic. And if she was faking the casual bravado, she deserved an award. He watched her carefully as they stepped out into the small, unkempt yard of Brad Vicker's house and saw her smile fade, quickly replaced by a look of vague sadness. And beyond that, the same kind of focused intensity that she'd had when she'd told them about Dr. Griffith and his research. Whatever she was thinking, he could see in that look that she was perfectly aware of the risks, but that she refused to be cowed by them. The perfect definition of bravery. David was satisfied with his decision to enlist Rebecca Chambers for their operation. She was smart, professional and committed as superior in her field of study as the rest of his team members were in theirs. He could only hope that their combined skills would be enough to get them in and out of Caliban Cove in one piece, bringing with them proof of Umbrella's experiments, an objective that would lead to the ruin of the company that had corrupted the stars, and perhaps let him sleep peacefully again. David nodded, and the two of them set off to make the call. After rereading the information on Caliban Cove, Rebecca folded the papers and carefully tucked them into the overnight bag under David's seat. He'd bought three bags at the airport, one for the weapons, currently in cargo, the others to carry on so they wouldn't attract attention. Rebecca wished they'd thought to buy some snacks while they were at it, 
she hadn't eaten since lunch, and the packet of nuts she'd swallowed after takeoff wasn't cutting it. She reached up to switch off the reading light and then settled back in her seat, trying to let the smooth hum of the 747 engines lull her into a doze. Most of the other passengers on the half-full plane were asleep. The dim night lights and the steady drone of the engines had already worked for David. But even as drained as she felt by the evening's events, she gave up the effort after a minute or two. There was too much to think about, and she knew that she wouldn't be able to sleep without at least sorting through some of it. I feel like I'm dreaming already anyway. This is just another weird tangent, a, a subplot that came out of left field. In the past three months, she graduated college, gone through STARS Bravo training, and moved to her first apartment in a new city only to end up one of the five survivors of a man-made disaster involving biological weapons and a corporate conspiracy. In the past three hours, her life had taken yet another totally unexpected turn. She'd thought about what she'd wished for earlier, a chance to get out of Raccoon City and study the T-Virus. The irony of the situation wasn't lost on her. But she wasn't so sure she liked the circumstances. She rolled her head to the side and looked at David crashed out in the window seat, dark circles of exhaustion beneath his closed lids. After briefly filling her in on a few details about the cove and outlining their schedule for the next day, he told her to try and take a nap. Have a lie down, had been his exact words, and then promptly taken his own advice, not falling asleep so much as lapsing into an instant coma. He even sleeps efficiently. No tossing or turning, like he willed himself to get as much rest as possible in the time allowed. He struck her as an extremely competent and intelligent man, if something of a loner. For as cool as he was under pressure, he seemed to freeze with small talk, leading her to wonder what kind of life he'd had. She was impressed with how quickly he'd come up with a plan to get them out of Barry's house, and was glad that he was leading the operation to Caliban Cove though it was hard to think of him as a captain. He didn't really project authority, and didn't seem to want to, practically insisting that she call him David. Even when he'd stepped into a leadership role during the attack, it hadn't felt like he was giving them orders so much as offering instruction. Maybe it's just the accent. Everything he says sounds so polite. He frowned in his sleep, his eyes flickering through uneasy dreams. After a few seconds, he let out a soft, childlike moan of distress. Rebecca briefly considered waking him up, but already he seemed to have got past whatever troubled him, his brow smoothing. Suddenly feeling like she was invading his privacy, Rebecca looked away. Dreaming about the attack, maybe? About having to kill someone he knew? She wondered if she'd be haunted by the image of the man she'd shot the shadowy figure that had crumpled to the ground next to Barry's house. She was still waiting for the guilt to hit her. And, thinking about it, she was surprised to find that her mind wasn't racing to rationalise the matter. She'd shot somebody. He could very well be dead. And all she felt was relief that she'd stopped him from killing her or anyone else on the team. Rebecca closed her eyes, taking a deep breath of the cool, pressurised air hissing through the cabin. She could smell the musky odour of dried sweat on her skin, and decided that taking a shower was first priority when they hit the hotel. David didn't want to risk going back to his house on the off chance that someone on the strike force had recognised him, so they were going to grab a couple of rooms near the airport, somewhere after they changed planes. The operation briefing was set for noon at the home of one of the other three members, an alpha forensic expert named Karen Driver. David had mentioned that Karen could probably lend her some clean clothes, though he'd actually blushed while saying it. He was a quirky one, all right. And after the briefing, we get our equipment and go in, just like that. The thought knotted her stomach and sent a chill through her, telling her the real reason she wasn't able to sleep. Only two weeks after the Umbrella Nightmare in Raccoon City, she was facing the same nightmare again. At least this time, she had some idea of what they'd be getting themselves into, 
and the plan was to get out of the facility without ever facing the T-virus creatures. But the memory of Umbrella's tyrant monster was still fresh in her mind. The massive, patchwork body and killing claw of the thing they'd seen on the estate. And the thought of what someone like Nicholas Griffith might have come up with using the virus. Rebecca decided that she'd thought enough. She had to get some sleep. She cleared her mind as best she could and focused on her breathing, slowing it down, counting backward in her mind from 100. The meditation technique had never failed her before, though she didn't think it would work this time. 99, 98, Dr. Griffith, David, Stars, Caliban. Before she reached 90, she was deeply asleep, dreaming of moving shadows that no light had cast. And with Rebecca drifting off into uneasy sleep, we end chapter four. I do hope we will soon be seeing the actual Caliban Cove itself and hopefully getting into the Umbrella facility. Uh, we need uh, a bit of setup, I'm sure. We have to meet the other members of this uh, strike squad that uh, these rogue stars agents are going to go in with. But I do think that having done all this to tie up the kind of loose ends at Raccoon City and let you know what's going to happen to the others, I am very keen to jump into some actual Resident Evil zombie action. Even if Rebecca isn't, and although she is hoping that she won't come across something like a tyrant, I do have a feeling that this book, and if my memory serves, still holds some of the usual Resident Evil game structure, and we will have a big, gribbly, T-virus creation to face at the end of the story. And in fact, if you're interested by this and would like to know a little bit more about Caliban Cove or any of the other Resident Evil novels before we read it here on the channel, uh, Willis Rose has very kindly given us a great couple of recommendations in the comments. Willis says, If you're interested in two in-depth videos for Resident Evil, then I recommend you check out both Beggy Beg Beg and The Gaming Muse, who make some of the most interesting analysis slash symbolism videos I've ever seen. I promise that you won't be disappointed. Thank you very much. I was very excited when I went onto uh, Beggy Beg Beg's channel and saw that there were analysis videos for every novel in the Resident Evil novel series. Very exciting. They were also doing analysis for Silent Hill extended universe stuff and analysis of the video games. All things that I think are very interesting and I hope that anyone else who enjoys Resident Evil might enjoy as well. Thanks again for the recommendation, Willis. Now, I'll move on to Chapter 5. As he did most mornings since beginning the experiment, Nicholas Griffith sat at the open platform at the top of the lighthouse and watched the sun rise over the sea. It was an awesome spectacle from beginning to end. First, the black waves shading to grey as the sky lightened. The craggy rocks that lined his cove slowly taking form in the misty winds that swept off the water. As the radiant star peered over the side of the world, its first hesitant rays stained the ocean a deep azure blue, painting the pastel horizon with promises of renewal and a gentle, nurturing acceptance of all that it touched. It was a lie, of course. Within hours, the molten giant would beat mercilessly against the shore, against this half of the planet. Its early mildness was a deception, a pretended ignorance of the seeping radiation and withering heat that would follow, but no less spectacular for the lying. It can't be blamed for a lack of self-awareness. After all, it is what it is. Griffith always watched until the sun cleared the curving horizon before getting on with his day. Although he appreciated the beauty of each glimmering dawn, it was the routine that appealed to him. Not his, but that of the cosmos. Each sunrise was a statement of fact, speaking to an inevitable progression of time. A reminder that the world spun eternally through its galactic paces oblivious to the dreams of the self-important beings that scurried across its surface. Beings such as myself, but the one very crucial difference. 
I know just how much my dreams are worth. As the swollen orb lifted itself from the sea, Griffith stood up and leaned against the platform railing, his thoughts turning to the day ahead. Having finally finished the blood work on the Leviathan series, he was ready to work more extensively with the doctors. All three had responded well to the change, and the rate of cellular deterioration had fallen considerably since he'd started with the enzyme injections. It was time to concentrate on their situational behaviour. The final stage of the experiment. Within the week, he'd be ready to expand beyond the confines of the facility. Expansion. A cleansing. A crisp, saline wind ruffled his grey hair, the hungry cries of coasting gulls finally spurring him to action. The tri-squads had to be brought in before the scavenging birds moved inland. Several of the units had already been horribly scarred, and he didn't want to risk any more of them until he was finished. Once they lost their eyes, they were useless on patrol. Still, it's been so long. No one's coming. If Dr. Amon had succeeded, they'd have sent someone by now. Too bad, really. He's probably still waiting. The thought was an uncomfortable one, conjuring hazy images of redness and heat of prone bodies in the manic sun and later the thunder of waves in the dark. He promptly buried the visions, reminding himself that it was in the past. Besides, he'd only done what was necessary. Griffith walked back inside, smoothing his wind-blown hair as he moved down the spiral staircase. His shoes clattered against the metal steps, creating a pleasant echo effect in the tall chamber. Having the facility to himself made everything pleasant, and he'd come to enjoy the little things, eating what he wanted, when he wanted, working his own hours, his mornings atop the lighthouse. Before he'd been crowded, forced to adhere to schedules that seemed designed to undercut creativity. Meal times, work times, sleep times, how could a man breathe, think, flourish in such conditions? He'd suffered for so long, sat through endless meetings, listened to the small-minded drivel of his colleagues as they'd raved over Birkin's T-virus. They'd slaved to come up with the tri-squads for Umbrella and had been deliriously happy with the results, apparently forgetting their failure with the MA7s. They were unable to see past their own arrogance to a bigger picture. As if the tri-squads are anything more than bodies with guns. Useful as guards, but hardly brilliant. Hardly important. Although he'd worked not to let it go to his head, Griffith allowed himself a single moment of pride as he reached the bottom of the stairs and started for the exit. He'd seen the T-virus for what it really was. A crude but effective platform for something far greater. He'd isolated the proteins reorganize the nucleocapsid's envelope to allow for variables in infective capacity, and created an answer, the answer to the blight that the human race had become, a solution without violence or suffering. Smiling, he'd stepped through the door into the cool shadow of the lighthouse, the crash of breaking waves at his back as he walked toward the dormitory building, He'd already synthesized an airborne and had enough of it to infect most of North America. As the virus spread, evolution would take its rightful place. The weak of spirit falling beneath those of truer instincts. And when it was over, the sun would rise over a very different world, inhabited by peaceful people of character and will. Take away a man's ability to choose his mind becomes free, a blank, clean slate. With training, he becomes a pet. Without, he becomes an animal, as harmless and serenely simple as a mouse. Cover the world with such animals, and only the strong survive. He stepped into the dorm's rec room and turned on the lights, still smiling. 
his doctors were right where he'd left them, sitting at the meeting table, eyes closed. Ideally, he'd run through the test with untrained subjects, but the three men would have to suffice. They'd been infected with the strain he would release, and were closest to what the world would become in a few days. My pets. My children. Besides the research laboratory, the Cove facility was designed to train bioweapons, like the Tri-Squads or MA-7s, but also to measure use of logic in the humanoid subjects. In the bunkers, there were a number of items he could use, from the simplest of peg tests to complex puzzles for those subjects capable of higher functioning. He doubted his doctors would be able to manage even the Red series, but watching their reactions would provide valuable insight, particularly the tests where there was a pressure factor. They think but can't make decisions. They function but not without input. How will they fare without my guiding hand? As he approached the table, Dr. Athens opened his eyes, perhaps to see if there was a threat coming. Of the three, Tom Athens was the strongest, the most likely to survive on his own. He'd been one of the behaviour specialists. In fact, he'd come up with the three-unit team idea, the Tri-Squad, insisting that the infected units would work more efficiently in small groups. He'd been right. Doctors Thurman and Kinnison remained still, and Griffith noticed a foul smell coming from one of them. Scowling, he looked down, his suspicions confirmed by the wetness on Dr. Thurman's pants. He shit himself again. Griffith felt a sudden, almost overwhelming pity for Thurman, but it was quickly replaced by an irritated disgust. Thurman had been an idiot before, a decent enough biologist, but as ridiculously narrow-minded as the rest of them. He'd grown most of the MA7s himself, and when they turned out to be uncontrollable, he'd laid blame on everyone but himself. If anyone deserved to wallow in his own filth, it was Louis Thurman. It was just too bad that the good doctor wasn't capable of understanding how repulsively pathetic he'd become. Without me, he wouldn't have lasted a day. Griffith sighed, stepping back from the table. Good morning, gentlemen, he said. In unison, the three men turned their heads to look up at him, their eyes as blank as their faces. As different as they were physically, the slackness of their features and slow, vapid gazes made them look like brothers. It seems that Dr. Thurman has evacuated his bowels, Griffith said. He's sitting in feces. That's funny. All three of them grinned widely. Dr. Kinnison actually chuckled. He'd been the last to be infected, so he had suffered the least tissue deterioration. Given the proper instructions, Alan could probably still pass for human. Griffith pulled the police whistle out of his pocket and put it on a table in front of Athens. Dr. Athens, recall the tri-squads from duty. Tend to their physical needs and send them to the cold room. When you've finished, go to the cafeteria and wait. Athens picked up the whistle as he stood, then walked out of the room, down the hall toward the dormitory's other entrance. The whistle would deactivate the teams and call them in. There were four tri-squads, twelve soldiers in all. They'd be roaming the woods along the fence or moving stealthily around the bunkers, having been trained to stay away from the northeast area of the compound, the lighthouse and dorm. Griffith had to admit they were quite effective at their purpose. Umbrella had wanted soldiers that would kill without mercy and fight until they were literally blown to pieces. The T-virus had been good for that much, and since they'd sped up the amplification time, they'd been able to turn out subjects in hours rather than days. Once trained with weapons, the Tri-Squads had become killing machines, although with the recent heat wave, he didn't know how much longer they'd be viable. 
Griffith turned his attention to Dr. Thurman, still grinning and stinking like some bloated infant. He even looked like a baby, pudgy and bald, his smile as innocent and guileless as a child's. Dr. Thurman, go to your room and remove your clothes. Shower and dress in clean clothes, then go to the caves and feed the MA7s. When you're finished, go to the cafeteria and wait. Thurman stood up, and Griffith saw that the padded chair was wet and stained. Christ. Take the chair with you, Griffith said, sighing. Leave it in your room. After he'd gone, Griffith sat down across from Alan, suddenly feeling tired. The anticipatory pride he'd felt only moments before was gone, leaving a cold emptiness in its place. My children. My creation. The virus was so beautiful, so perfectly engineered, that the first time he'd seen it, he'd wept. Months of private research, of picking apart the T-virus, an isolating effect, culminating in that first micrograph. While the others had been gloating over their war toys, he'd found the true path to a new beginning. And do they appreciate what I've done? Do any of them know how crucial this is? Crapping himself like a disgusting child, like a monkey! "'Disgracing my work, my life!' Griffith looked at Alan Kinnison, studying his handsome features, his expressionless eyes. Dr. Kinnison stared back, waiting to be told what to do. He'd been a neurologist once. There were pictures in his room of his wife and baby, a little boy with a bright, beautiful smile. Griffith's sanity shuddered suddenly a terrible, rending twist that made him dizzy, a thousand voices screaming unintelligibly through the cracks of reality. For just a second he felt as if he were losing his mind. How many will just starve to death, sitting in puddles of filth, waiting? Millions? Billions? What if I'm wrong? Griffith whispered. Alan, tell me I'm not wrong, that I'm doing this for the right reasons. You're not wrong, Dr. Kinnison said calmly. You're doing this for the right reasons. Griffith stared at him. Tell me your wife's a whore. My wife's a whore, Dr. Kinnison said. No pause, no doubt. Griffith smiled, and the fear melted away. Look at what I've accomplished. It's a gift, my creation. A gift to the world. A chance for man to become strong again. A peaceful death for all the Louis Thurmans in existence. Better than they deserve. He'd been working too hard tiring himself, and the strain was getting to him. He was only human after all. But he couldn't afford to let the stress of his body affect his mind again. There would be no more tests. He'd spend the day getting ready instead, preparing himself for the cleansing. Tomorrow, at sunrise, Dr. Griffith would give his gift to the wind. Ooh, that is a creepy chapter. Love it. That was exactly what I wanted, S.D. Perry. I was really concerned it was going to be more, I'm not going to say boring, but let's say lower pace, not as engaging uh, chapters where we were meeting more star members and just setting up stuff like that. But this has revealed the monstrosities of the show, of the show, of the book. This is a sort of unique selling point that I knew the book had, where it had zombies being used as sort of, well, not complete zombies, zombies with a little bit more brain. Um, similar to the way zombies start acting in, I believe it is Land of the Dead, uh, Romero's Land of the Dead, uh, where you have zombies that 
pick up guns or zombies that repeat actions that they did very often throughout their life. Um, so, but this is where it's the T virus has been modified to produce this effect. And I had forgotten this whole immediate thing of everyone there's dead because this one dude has turned everyone into a zombie or a zombie kind of thing. The MA7s, I'm not sure if the MA7s are the individuals of these zombies and then the tri-squads are the little three teams they've been put into, or if the MA7s are a different monster altogether, I suspect they're a different monster. This is really exciting. I am really happy about this. I'd forgotten about this kind of cult leader almost feeling to it, this bio-terrorist angle, rather than the simple evil corporation producing bioweapons for profit. I hope you're as interested in this different direction the story is taking as I am, and that you will join me again next week. Please, if you have enjoyed this video, give us a like, and if you want to listen to more of it, or hear other audiobooks that we've got coming up, press that subscribe button, and if you hit the bell icon, it'll let you know when we have videos coming out. At the moment, we're on a schedule of a video every Wednesday, every Friday, and then we are live every Sunday doing the Fulcrum Entertainment podcast. And we are currently going through reviewing, with spoilers, every Moon Knight episode as it comes out. One final shout out to Sweet Mango Limited who says, nice one bud, keep it going. Thank you so much, my dude. I hope you're having a good time with this book as well. That's it from me. Don't forget to recommend us to your friends if they would enjoy audiobooks like this. And keep in mind, we are all Fulcrum.